reach sensible decisions, the politicians in Brussels want well-founded assessments of the fish stocks. This is why the EU maintains the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea, or ISIS. The committee is made up of several hundred scientists. Based on the data they collect, they formulate recommendations for fishery policies. Christopher Zimmerman is a member of ISIS and knows the limits of this advisory position. Whenever we say the quotas can be raised, everyone says, great, good idea. But if we say the quotas have to be reduced, then people will say, that can't be right, the science is wrong. The scientists have to face the allegation that their recommendations are too cautious, that their research is not thorough enough, that they need a better understanding of the dynamics of the fish stock to determine the necessary quotas. From a scientific point of view, we have to say that our data are sufficient. What we already know is enough to implement sustainable fishery management. The problem from our point of view is that our recommendations are not followed, that quotas are not adapted to the state of the fish stocks. The politicians who support this tendency are in turn supported by the fishing lobby, essentially by the big players in the business, who just want things to stay the way they are. The new commissioner is actually on our side, and the problem actually starts with the Agriculture and Fisheries Council. The people with the real power when it comes to making decisions are the respective ministers of the member states. They're the ones who decide on the quotas. We have all this bargaining uh, with the member states, with the ministers, about uh, how much they are going to fish. And um, it, it, now it seems that it is a pride for every member state <laughs> to come and negotiate and afterwards uh, get uh, some more. We are talking about uh, big interests here. Eh? In uh, Japan, there was an auction about just the fish, one fish, a bluefin tuna fish. And one piece of fish was sold for 400,000 euros. It's like uh, an enterprise, one fish, a, an apartment. So we're talking about big prices, we're talking about uh, a lot of money. So things cannot uh, <laughs> change easily. Eh? But we have to realize that there is no other way out because even the people who get this big money if they are going like this, after two or three years, maybe five years, they will have nothing. Even them, even them, even them, the rich, the millionaires. For many years now, biologists and engineers have been looking for ways to end this destructive exploitation of the seas. They're banking on aquaculture, which has found ways to breed large quantities of fish. industry is growing rapidly. Almost one in every two fish consumed worldwide comes from aquaculture and its share of the global fish market continues to grow. And the methods are being continuously improved, especially in Europe and North America. of medication is strictly regulated, as is the amount of cage space afforded to the fish. That means they stay healthy and don't suffer from stress. All the same, ecologists give the concept of marine aquaculture poor marks. Many of the saltwater fish bred in aquaculture facilities are predators. That means they are high up in the food chain. It's as if we were to breed lions and tigers and catch game from the woods to feed them. There's no sense in that. On land, we have cows and pigs lower down in the food chain. That is not the case with fish farming. That involves catching fish in the wild and feeding them to the predators in the aquaculture farms. To get his fish to grow quickly and reach the required size within a year, the fish farmer must constantly feed his stock. The amount of wild fish in the feed fluctuates with the prices for commodities such as fish meal and fish oil. Wild fish can account for up to 60% of the fish food. The more fish in fish meal and fish oil, the better.
It means the fish are fed something similar to what they would eat if they led normal lives as predators. It makes for maximum growth and hence maximum profit. Most of the fish meal used in aquaculture comes from South America. Peru is the world's biggest producer. Some 1.5 million tons of fish meal are exported from here every year. About half of it is produced in a single city, 500 kilometers north of Lima. The demand for fish meal from Peru is extremely high all over the world right now. It's rich in proteins, and that makes it very popular on the global market. This market is insatiable. Demand far outstrips what we can produce. About 6 million tons of fish meal a year are sold on the global market. In Peru, it is only produced for a few months a year, when large schools of anchovies migrate along the coast. Then the factories are on the go for 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. The fish meal business yields great wealth for a select few, and the region pays a high ecological price. The wastewater from the factories is released back into the sea untreated, complete with fish leftovers, blood and fat. Over decades, this organic waste has settled and built up on the floor of the Bay of Chimpote. The biologists at the Peruvian National Marine Research Institute, IMAPE, are powerless to do anything except document the environmental damage. This smell of sulfur is typical. The sediment on the sea floor is mostly made up of sulfur and methane. We assume that conditions there are devoid of oxygen. We're talking about a contaminated layer of mud ranging from 2 to 8 meters thick. The community of animals living on the sea floor is probably the hardest hit. It's totally impoverished, just like the fish stocks. We used to have various types of grouper and croaker, very fine species, great eating for humans. There used to be plenty of them here and many other species too that weren't regarded first and foremost as food. Now they're all gone because their natural habitat has been destroyed. It's important to make this known and to find a solution. That's the priority. As well as its local repercussions, fish meal production has other, more far-reaching consequences. The 30 million tons of smaller fish processed for fish meal every year are then missing from the food web. Ecological research leaves no doubt about that. This is especially hard on animals whose diets are specialized in these fish, seabirds and marine mammals. Though they might live in nature reserves and other habitats far away from the fish meal factories, they are still in direct competition with the fishing fleets. A cormorant eats about 22,000 anchovies, sardines and herrings in a lifetime. A mature sea lion consumes about eight kilos a day. And you might say the tip of the food chain is just the tip of the iceberg.
Also die kleinen Beutefische, die The small fish that are caught on a large scale to make fish meal occupy a key position in the marine food web. They play an important role, both the fish they prey on and the fish that prey on them. If we take a key species out of the system, the entire system suffers. On the coast of Namibia, for example, overfishing of sardines has resulted in a glut of jellyfish. Of course, that's a negative effect. Marine aquaculture uses up a lot of fish. That means it's not a solution. One main problem is that farming predator fish consumes more fish than it produces. Often it takes two to five kilograms of wild fish to produce a single kilo of farmed fish, sometimes even more. That may take some of the fishing pressure off the bigger predators, but it adds to the pressure on the prey. And this does not lead to an improvement in the situation. It exacerbates the problem of overfishing. Not all fish are predator fish. There are plenty of freshwater fish that live off plants and make for good food. To breed them, there's no need for the sea. There's no need even for a pond or river. The Dutch food company Fission Anova breeds a special kind of fish in enclosed halls. It's called clares and is especially well suited to aquaculture. The fish are unaggressive and can be farmed in dense populations. They grow quickly and have very efficient metabolisms. It takes just 700 grams of feed to produce a kilo of clares. A kilo of chicken requires five times as much feed. 70% of the feed is derived from plants. 30% is fish meal. Clares are not purely herbivore, they're omnivores. To stay healthy, there must be some fish in their food. But they need far less than predator fish. To produce a kilo of salmon, you need two to three kilos of wild fish. It takes far less to raise a clares to maturity. So clares farming produces more fish than it consumes, not the other way around. This is why biologists give top environmental marks to largely herbivore freshwater fish farms. Of course, uh, sustainability is important because we want to make a good product, but also important because uh, for the market, uh, people are more and more aware of uh, that it's important not to, to fish the sea empty. Of course, uh, you could not, could not sell a fish that is not uh, very good just because it is sustainable. Uh, it's very important that uh, next to that, it's also a good product. A Clares farm like this produces a thousand tons of fish per year. High performance centers like this can take some of the burden off the oceans because they don't involve breeding predator fish. But there are other forms of sustainable aquaculture too. Organic aquaculture is less intensive. It can produce fish, but shrimp or prawns can also be farmed. The shrimp farm Biocentinella produces western white shrimps. They live in brackwater in river deltas, where the salt water mingles with fresh water. of this farm, Javier Barragan, switched to organic aquaculture 10 years ago, but not entirely of his own free will. In the year 2000-2001, uh, uh, we had a, a very devastating disease for shrimp, which is the white spot. The tendency at that moment was to increase the use of, of antibiotics to tried to do something about it, but it was worse. So I said, we will not give any more chemicals or antibiotics, even if I go broke, but it's no sense to do that. And amazingly, nothing happened. The mortality didn't increase, it uh, stopped. And then a company from UK said, well, I want to buy your product under the organic principle. And I said, yeah, okay, how much? All your products. 
Barrigan's farm has been certified as an organic and fair trade operation since 2002. That means he has to observe strict guidelines. Every year, an